Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Mrs. America, if your husband isn't with you by the radio tonight, please get him. Tell him that 14 minutes from now, the Equitable Society, the sponsor of this program, has some important news for homeowners as well as for people who are thinking of buying or building a home. Tell him that he's going to hear about a money-saving plan that will give him and you special protection. It's known as America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Lighthouse. As we speak to you tonight, an unprecedented tidal wave of crime is sweeping our country from coast to coast through village and hamlet and town and city, destroying lives and property, and smashing savagely at the very pilings on which rests the whole structure of American society. It is the biggest crime wave in the history of our country. As to its magnitude, we need say no more than this, that major crimes alone, one of which we report tonight, are being committed at the rate of almost 5,000 every 24 hours. That morning, when her wounded veteran husband was discharged from a Long Island hospital wearing his first set of civvies in nearly four years, Ann Roswell was waiting outside for him in their small convertible. A few hours later, they were driving slowly over a rough dirt trail. Anne. Yes? Can I open my eyes now? Dick, don't you dare. But I'm supposed to see where I'm driving. I'm handling that. And uh, besides, we're almost there. Where? Never mind. Hey, I smell salt water, don't I? <laughs> Do you? We're in Maryland, right? Are we? Sure. And Maryland and salt water means we're somewhere along the shore of Chesapeake Bay. Dick, keep your eyes shut. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll keep guessing. Let's see. Um, you rented us a cottage? No. A tent? No. A foxhole? <laughs> oh, really? All right, we're here. But don't look yet. <sighs> there. Darling. Hmm? You remember that letter you wrote me from some island about... Where you'd like to spend our second honeymoon. Yeah. You said that you'd like to find an old abandoned lighthouse and... 
Well, look. Baby, you did it. Uh-huh. I, I found it about a month ago and finally dug up the people who own it. Oh, gee, this is wonderful. They never come here, so they said we could use it. Oh, baby. There's not much furniture. Who cares? Come on. Let's go look inside, quick. All right. Oh, be careful, darling. Never mind my leg. Come on. Give me your hand, baby. Okay. That's the front door right there. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's take over. How old is this place, do you know? Mm, very, very old. Maybe we'll even find some buried treasure around. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Here we are. Wait a minute. Uh, what's the matter? We've got to do this according to regulations. I'm carrying you through the doorway. Oh, but, Dick, darling, you can't. Your I'm leg. carrying you, baby. Come on. Oh, this darling. is the way we do it. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, a big kiss before I put Dick. you down. Huh? Look. Look over there on the couch. Wait a minute. Oh. You stand right here. He, uh, He looks like he's dead. Dick, is he... No, he's not dead. But he's sure knocked out. What happened to him? The hypo needle on this table probably had something to do with it. What's he blindfolded for? I don't know, but looks like we've stumbled into something, baby. What do we do, Dick? We're going to get the police as fast as we can. Come on, let's... Stay where you are, oh. both of you. Who are you? Answer me. If there's any questions to be answered, the boss will take care of that when he gets here. In the meantime... Oh, Dick! That's for crashing the party without an invite. Now sit down. Earlier that day, in the Baltimore field office of the FBI, agent in charge Grant received an urgent telephone call, after which he quickly summoned Special Agent Coleman to his desk. Got something hot off the wire, Mr. Grant? Yes. Do you know who John Berkeley is? You mean the plastics manufacturer here? That's the one. He just telephoned. His son, young Howard Berkeley, has been kidnapped. Well, when was this? Sometime after 6 o'clock last night. Young Berkeley had gone up to the family cottage on the bay yesterday by himself to work on his boat. Yes. At 6 o'clock, he telephoned his home to say he was staying at the cottage all night. And that was the last they heard from him. Oh, how did they know he was kidnapped? The father just got an anonymous telephone call a while ago to that effect. Oh, the caller, a man, said Berkeley would receive his instructions later. And in the meantime? Here's the location of the cottage Berkeley gave me. You should be able to find it all right. Uh-huh. You better take a run up there right now and see if you can pick up any leads. Oh. Okay. I'll arrange to have approaches covered right away so we'll get the ransom note without having to contact Berkeley in the open to get it. Right. Get back here as soon as you can. Things may start moving fast. <laughs> Yes, Dick? Give me your hand. I, I want to stand up a minute. But that man said... My leg's getting stiff. Oh, he, here. Wait a minute. What are you doing? Just stretching. Sit down. He's just got out of an army hospital. He was wounded. So what? He has to exercise his leg. Not on my time, so sit down. <laughs> if you didn't have that gun... Look, look, I've got it. Okay. How, uh... How long are you keeping us here? I told you. That's up to the boss. Hey, wait a minute. That's him coming now. Does that mean we can go? Well, you can ask him that question. Hmm. He must have saw your car. Ox. Yeah? Whose car is that? Well, we had some unexpected company, but everything's under control. Oh, Who are they? They claim they got permission to use the lighthouse for a second honeymoon. Well, how romantic. Who are you? I'm Dick Roswell, and this is my wife. Where do you come from? We live in the New York suburbs, Scarsdale. Oh, the Westchester set, huh? What'll we do with them? 
Mr. Roswell? Yes? I think you ought to know what's going on here. I already have an idea. Did you tell him, Ox? Of course not. Well, that character on the couch there is what you'd call in Westchester a house guest. He's staying here until we collect a chunk of dough from his old man. Kidnapping. Lady, you're being very crude. This is strictly a business deal. Look, what are you telling them all this stuff for? Because they're going to help us, Ox. Huh? On account of this is a business deal, Mrs. Roswell is going to write a business letter for us. Well, what's the idea? A dame's handwriting will set up a good false lead. Oh. Oh, yeah, I get it. And besides, her fingerprints won't mean anything, huh? That's right, Ox. Mrs. Russell, you'll find a box of paper and a pencil on the table there. You mean you... you want me to write that? It's okay, baby. Here. Here's the paper. Did I ask you to butt in? I'm just handing her a sheet of paper, that's all. Here, Ann. Ready, lady? Yes, sir. Then take this note. To Mr. John R. Berkeley, 2705 Linwood Drive, Baltimore. Here's the Berkeley's morning mail, Mr. Grant. Just came. Good. And if I'm not mistaken, here's the letter we've been waiting for. Handle it carefully, Coleman. We don't want to spoil any fingerprints. Right. Here you are. I cleared the post office at 2 a.m. this morning. Yes. Well, let's have a look. What does it say? Berkeley is supposed to leave $20,000 in fives, tens, and twenties in a sack in the boat up at the cottage. When? By midnight tonight. Hmm, say, uh, what's that say about the Baltimore Herald? Berkeley is to run a notice in the afternoon's Herald saying instructions are being complied with. The usual threat, of course, to the victim. Yes. Well, there's not much time to get that notice in the paper. It'll be in there. And the money will be in the boat tonight, too. I'm calling Berkeley now to arrange it. Uh, while I'm doing that, get a messenger and shoot him over to the bureau with that note. To check it for fingerprints? Yes, and the handwriting, too. Which is a woman's, or I miss my guess. Oh, looks like it. Well, we ought to hear from the bureau in two or three hours. Maybe we'll get the lead that will drown those water rats. Say, boss. What is it, Ox? You need any help? No, I'm just about finished. What's he doing? Tying Berkeley up. We deliver him tonight. Can't he whistle any other song? He happens to like that song. He also happens to like the singer who uses it. It also happens to be driving us crazy. <laughs> well, everything's in real good shape. Uh, boss. Well? What time is it? Why? Well, it'll take us nearly an hour to row across to that boathouse. That's right. Well, how much time we got? Enough. Uh, you, uh, haven't said what we're gonna do with, uh, him and her. That's right. Well? Ox, give me the hypo needle. Berkeley don't need no more, boss. I just stuck him a few minutes ago, remember? Ox. Yeah? The needle. Okay. There you are. And here's the stuff. Mrs. Roswell? Yes, sir? Raise your right sleeve. Wait a minute. Well? You're not going to give her any hypo. Raise your sleeve, Mrs. Roswell. No. No, don't. You heard what I said. Raise your sleeve. No! No, no! Get away no. from her! Get away from me, you... Hold it, Jim! <clears throat> Thanks, Ox. Now, Lord, load Berkeley in the boat, will you, while I put Mrs. Roswell to sleep. Now, before the FBI file on the Sinister Lighthouse resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week, at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, I met a self-sacrificing father. 
Because of an expensive operation that saved his little daughter's life, this father found that he was unable to meet the monthly payments on his home. But he'd forgotten that the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan provides a cash fund for just such financial emergencies. Well, you should have seen the relief on his face when he learned that he could keep his home and that the cash fund in his Assured Home Ownership Plan would take care of his monthly payments for a full year. This cash fund is just one of five major advantages of the Assured Home Ownership Plan. The other four are, one, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. And besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Two, the special cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage, pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years, saving six years' interest. Three, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Four, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission or bonus charges. Frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the Assured Home Ownership Plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sinister Lighthouse. In crimes of abduction, such as reported tonight from the files of your FBI, kidnappers have all the advantages at first. But not for long does this unfavorable balance remain intact. For time and events in the course of executing their prepared plot are constantly at work against them. And quite often, it is some unexpected event which leads to their undoing. Certainly in this case, the appearance of the war veteran and his bride at the lighthouse hideout was an unexpected event. It is now about 11 o'clock. On the floor of the lighthouse lie the unconscious forms of the war veteran and his bride. A few yards away, the kidnappers are putting out from shore in a rowboat. At their feet, the drugged body of their victim. And in the Baltimore office of the FBI, a few miles away. Well, an hour from now, Mr. Grant, the kidnappers will have collected that $20,000, and here we are just sitting. I know. This is the toughest part of a kidnapping case, Coleman. I'd give anything if we could be at that boathouse when they get there. So would I. But we can't gamble with the victim's life. Well, we should be hearing from Washington. I know they've had the ransom note for several hours now. Well, there must have been some fingerprints on it. Maybe none they've got a record of. Washington. I hope so. Grant speaking. Right. It's Washington, all right. I got my fingers crossed. Hello? Yes? Uh-huh. Woman's handwriting, huh? We figured that much. Any record of it? I see. What about fingerprints? What? But that doesn't make sense. Uh-huh. All right, I got the name. Lives where? Okay, we'll go to work on it right now. Thanks. What doesn't make sense? The note was written by a woman. There are five good fingerprints of a man on it. Well, that's not so hard to take. But this part is. The duplicates of those prints were found in the non-criminal file. Huh? 
They are the prints of a discharged veteran with a clean record. Well... And what's more, he was just released yesterday morning from a Long Island Army hospital. Hey, wait a minute. That's what I say. But fingerprints don't lie. I know, He and his wife live with his family in Scarsdale, New York. Let's get the New York office on the phone, and fast. Say, say, boss. Well? I think we... We got away with them 20 G's too easy. Just keep on rowing, Ox, and be thankful for this fog. Anyway, I'm glad we got that kid off our hands now. I think you've got a point there, Ox. Yeah, I was beginning to get... Hey. Well, Wait a minute. Look, that, that kid won't be able to tell nobody nothing about us because he never got a look at us. That's right. But the other two got a real good look at us. So? Well, maybe we ought to go back to that lighthouse and knock them off for keeps. Look, so far we've done this job clean, and that's the way it stays. But they can identify us. For that, they need our names, where we're from, and our fingerprints, none of which they have. Yeah, but if... Keep on rowing to where we hit the car. We're getting back to New York fast. <laughs> Take it easy, fellow. Huh? You'll be all right. Who, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. FBI? That's right. Oh. Anne, my wife. Where is she? She's right here. But they Apparently, were... Apparently, she was drugged. Uh, she's coming around all right now, Mr. Grant. Good. It'll take a couple of minutes for her mind to clear. If I ever get my hands on those dirty... Just tell us what you know about them quickly. Well, sure, but... But how did you get here? I mean... Fortunately, your fingerprints were on the ransom note. Good, then it worked. What do you mean? I did that on purpose. I knew my prints would be on record on account of being in the Army, and maybe you could trace us here that way. That's just what happened. Ann and I came here for our second honeymoon. We know all that. We've talked to your folks. And you stumbled into a kidnapping. Yeah. And they forced your wife to write the note. That's right. They've collected the ransom by now... Now it's up to us to catch them, with your help. What do you want to know? How many were there? Two. Can you give us a good description? Well, let me see. Um... Well, did they have any distinguishing characteristics or marks or habits that might help us? Well, the only habit I remember was the boss kept whistling the same tune over and over and over. What tune? I never heard it before. Any particular reason for him whistling it? The other one let something slip about some girl that sings it all the time. Who was she? He, did, he didn't say. Did you get any idea where they're from? They seem to know New York pretty well. See if you can remember how the tune went. Well, I'm not much oh. good at that. But... Dick. A Anne. Uh, Anne, darling. Dick. Everything's all right, baby. Maybe she can remember how that tune went. Yeah. Anne. Uh. Listen, baby. Dick, I... I'm so sick. I... You're gonna be okay, darling. Listen, you gotta help these men. They're from the FBI. What? That tune he was whistling all the time. Tune? Yeah, the, the one that kidnapper whistled. How did it go? I... I don't remember. Sure I... you do. You never forget a tune. Come on, snap out of it, baby. You remember that song? It might help the FBI catch them. The FBI? What do you want to see me about? Since you're a prominent nightclub operator here in New York, Mr. Cardoni, you might be just the man who can help us. What do you mean? We want you to identify a tune for us. A tune? What tune? We don't believe it's published. Probably special material. Uh, Mrs. Roswell. Yes? 
Would you sing it for him? Hey, now look here. If this is some trick to get this girl an audition... We identified ourselves, Cardoni. And we're after a couple of kidnappers. Sing the tune, Mrs. Roswell. Um... Do... Do, 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 da, 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 da. Okay, okay. I know it's not an audition gag now. What's the tune? That's Kay Wentworth's theme song. Who's she? Nightclub singer. I booked her here several times. Where is she now? Around town. Why? Who's her boyfriend? Is she married? To whom? Trumpet player. Oh. That bad? Uh, look, Mr. Grant. Yes? Just because our man whistles a tune all the time doesn't necessarily mean he knows Kay Wentworth. That's true. He might be, well, just an ardent admirer of hers. Uh, is Miss Wentworth singing anywhere now, Mr. Cardoni? No. You know what I'm thinking, Mr. Grant? I believe I do. Mr. Cardoni. Yeah? I'm sure you book your talent for the club far in advance, but this is an emergency. And if you cooperate with the FBI, you may be helping us to... Ladies and gentlemen, as the piece de resistance of our Sunday night celebrity show here at the Key Club, we present that scintillating singer of sophisticated songs, Miss Kay Whitworth. <laughs> There she is, boss. Oh, she's gorgeous, huh? And you keep quiet now, Ox, or you'll eat this bottle. Huh, boss? Shut up. You. Boss. I told you to keep but look, quiet. look who's coming this way. I don't care who it it's is. It's them I... kids from the lighthouse. What? And they got two other guys with them. Let's get out of here. Just a minute, you. What's the idea? I believe you already know Mr. and Mrs. Roswell here. And we're special agents of the FBI. Look, I don't know what... They're the men, all right. Then sit back down, both of you. We went to a lot of trouble to arrange Miss Wentworth's appearance here, especially for you, mister. You ought to hear the finish of her number. You'll have a lot of time to whistle it. The Berkeley kidnappers were tried and convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal penitentiary. Yes, the tremendous upsurge of crime in post-war America finds the kidnapper at work again. Undaunted by the fact that his predecessors back in the 20s and early 30s were, without exception, brought to justice. But your FBI warns him here and now that once again, with the cooperation of you, the American citizen, he and all his breed will be wiped out. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. Certain features of the Equitable Society's assured home ownership plan are easily remembered, such as the low interest of only 4% and the fact that if the owner dies, the widow owns the home free and clear. But there are other facts about this plan that you should know. And that's why we suggest you see the nearest Equitable Society representative without delay. He has all the information at his fingertips and plenty of literature for reference and study. Call him tomorrow. Look up the number of the Equitable Life Assurance Society in your phone book. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Flowers for the Corpse. Flowers for the Corpse. 
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Flowers for the Corpse. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Later in tonight's program, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have a special announcement for homeowners, future homeowners as well as present. Please have a pencil and paper handy. This is America's finest plan for home ownership, and it offers so many advantages in economy and security that you will surely want to write down the instructions for getting further information. Get ready for the good news on America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, Flowers for the Corpse. Professional thieving is a business. And some forms of it, just as some forms of legitimate business, are conducted on a nationwide scale with accomplices in major cities throughout the country acting as sales outlets for the stolen goods. But your FBI, one of whose jobs it is to smash these rings, also operates on a nationwide scale. And no matter how cunning the methods of the one, they are no match for the unrelenting vigilance of the other. And it is inevitable, as illustrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it is inevitable that sometime, at some point, the twain shall meet. The greenhouse floral business, operated by Merrill Sheridan and his widowed aunt in the suburbs of a large Midwestern city, had, until a few months ago, produced only a modest income. Then it began to prosper smartly. But at the moment, this sudden financial success means nothing to Merle Sheridan. He stands forlornly in his greenhouse, contemplating a flower. Merle? Oh, Merle? Uh, yes, Aunt Kathy? I thought you were coming into the house for lunch. I was. Is something wrong? Yes, it's this iris. Oh, what about it? I'm convinced it deliberately committed suicide. But I thought it was doing so well. It was. Well, perhaps you can revive it. I wouldn't give the stupid thing another chance. Oh, oh look, look, isn't that... Isn't that Mr. Durham outside? Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry to say. Why, Merle, he's our most profitable customer. I appreciate him, darling, but I don't trust him. Well, good morning. Oh, good, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Durham. I would have gotten here sooner, but traffic in the city was extraordinarily Mr. heavy. Mr. Durham, yes? you obviously received my telegram. Oh, uh, yes. You said you had a rare variety of tulip bulb that I might be interested in, correct? Yes. I'll watch the office, Merle. Very well, Aunt Kathy. May I see the rare specimen? Certainly. Here we are. Well, 
Let me look at it. Don't be impatient. I'll handle it. Here, cup your hand. Very well. That's it. Now I shall pull its false bottom out by the roots. Thusly, and... Good Lord, Sharon. Does it please you? Why, it's one of the most beautiful emeralds I've seen. It's the late property of some plushy dowager, I'd say. Why, it's... It's at least 20 carats. And Kathy and I will settle for 25,000. Well, I'll, I'll do the best I can. You'll probably sell it for twice that, but remember, you will still get only your usual one-third share. Now, look here, Sheridan. I've told you before... You're entitled to a larger share. I know. This is a precarious enterprise for all of us, but I've spent nearly 20 years building my business, and if I'm caught in just one of these transactions, what happens to the house at Durham, and where am I? And Kathy and I will see to it that you have fresh flowers in your cell every day. Now, see here. That's enough. Just dash on back to the house of Durham, old dear, and do the best you can for one-third. The same morning in that city's field office of the FBI, agent in charge Craig was sitting at his desk when Special Agent Highland entered from the teletype room. Good morning, Mr. Craig. Hello, Highland. What have you got there? Special bulletin to all field officers from Washington. Oh, what's up? A series of jewel robberies. Three cities along the eastern seaboard, one right after the other. Sounds like the work of one gang. Yes, here's the bulletin. Mm -hmm. None of the stuff is turning up in the cities where it was stolen, so the police figure the gang is fencing it out around the country. I don't see any description of the stuff here. There's a follow-up teletype coming in. Quite a long list. I see. I don't imagine any of the stones are in their original mounting now, though. No, jewel gangs are usually smart enough to unmount the stones before trying to dispose of them. They're harder to identify that way. And reduces the chances of finding them to about one in a million, too. Well, don't be so pessimistic. You said there's quite a long list of it, right? Yeah, but I also... All the FBI has to do is find just one piece of the jewelry or just one of the stones. But the tough part is finding that one stone. I know, and maybe none of this stuff will ever turn up in our particular bailiwick, but we've got to go on the assumption that it will, so let's get busy. What first? For start, let's alert the police, all pawn shops, and all insurance companies which insure jewelry. Right. Hello? Hello, Sheridan? Oh, hello, Durham. I've just deposited my personal check for $20,000 to your bank account. For what? I sold the stone for $30,000 and kept my one-third $10,000. is not that good news? No. Why not? A little birdie told me you collected $6,000 more as federal luxury tax. Well... Didn't you? Well, yes, but... Then deposit $4,000 of it to my account at once. Now, look! The tax money belongs to the government. You're not paying taxes on stolen gems, and you know it. Sheridan, I told you I wanted more than one-third share, and I'm keeping that $6,000 as a bonus until you're ready to revise our agreement. What kind of flowers do you want? Never mind threatening me. Listen, Durham. Well? All right. Keep your bonus. That's just what... What? I've just decided that from now on we're going to do business on a different basis. What do you mean? I'll fix the amount that Aunt Kathy and I are to have, and you pay it to us in cash on the spot. Then whatever you sell the article for later is your business. How's that? But what if I don't agree with your price? You can take it or leave it. Very well. Good. And we'll start tomorrow. Tomorrow? I'll have an article by then that will be worth $10,000 to Aunt Kathy and me, so bring that much cash with you. But what if You I... will not be obligated to buy, but just be prepared to. And make it about... One o'clock. I'll be there. You sent for me, Mr. Craig? Yes, Island. You were kind of pessimistic yesterday, weren't you, about our chances of ever finding any of those stolen jewels? Well, yes. I've just had an interesting telephone call. You don't mean one of them has turned up already? One of the stolen jewels described on that list was a 20-carat emerald, wasn't it? Yes. An insurance company that we alerted yesterday just phoned to report that they'd been asked to insure a 20-carat emerald. What? It was brought to them by Mrs. V.A. Madison. Her husband is the head of the Power and Light Company. I know, but you don't think that either he or his wife are buying a stolen emerald? No, they wouldn't have to know it had been stolen. He purchased the emerald yesterday. Where? 
Why don't you go ask him? I'm on my way now. Good afternoon, ma'am. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Durham. What can I do for you? I have an appointment with your nephew. Oh, yes. He's back in the greenhouse. Shall I go get him? No, no. I'll find him. Sheridan! Sheridan! Don't shout, Mr. Durham. Uh, Sheridan, you said you'd have an article for me to look at. That's right, I did. Well? I also told you it would cost you $10,000 in cash. Provided I want to buy it. Are you prepared to? Certainly. I don't see anything green that isn't a plant, old boy. All right, here's the money. Look at it. How much is there? $10,000. I can't afford to trust you anymore. It's much too expensive. Well, here, count it yourself. I'd be delighted. All hundreds? Each of those packages contains $1,000. Fine. Then I'll take four of them. Huh? Here. You may have the rest back. What are you doing? Just evening the score, that's all. What? My dear fellow, you held out $4,000 on me yesterday, didn't you? Oh, I get it. This was all just a trick. A rather clever one, don't you think? Give me back that money. Not a chance, old dear. Now I must look after the petunia. Why, you... Please go away before I sick the snapdragons on you. Either you give me back that money this minute, Sheridan, or... or... you'll do what? I'll tell the police that you commissioned me to sell a 20-carat emerald for you yesterday. Really? And after I had innocently incriminated myself, you confessed that it was stolen and offered me more stolen jewels to get rid of. That would be very unwise. Look, I want to get out of this business anyway. You keep the $4,000. I'm going to the police. Just a minute, Mr. Durham. What? You're not going to make trouble for us. Get out of my way. Sorry. <gasps> Thank you, Aunt Kathy. You're so considerate. And now, before the FBI file on flowers for the corpse resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, I heard the inspiring story of a young hero who gave his life trying to save someone else's home, trying to save people trapped in a burning building. Not long before his death, this gallant young man had started to purchase a home for his own family under the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Thanks to his foresight, his widow didn't inherit a mortgage. She inherited a home she now owns free and clear. You see, the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan offers home buyers these five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. And besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with a canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage, pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years, saving six years' interest. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, Liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyers' fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission or bonus charges. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home... Get complete information on the Assured Home Ownership Plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now... Back to the FBI file, Flowers for the Corpse. (laughs) 
professional jewel thieves and their accomplices, so often glamorized by authors of mystery adventure fiction and endowed with almost supernatural talents, are neither glamorous nor supernatural to your FBI or to law enforcement agencies cooperating in their capture. To them, they're just another lot of criminals, just another patch of scum fouling the waters of decent society, and just as vulnerable as any other kind of criminal. At about the time the jeweler Durham was making his fatal visit to the Sheridan Greenhouse, Special Agent Highland of the FBI was concluding his visit to V.A. Madison, purchaser of the stolen emeralds. A little later, accompanied by Agent in Charge Craig, he visited Durham's office. I'm sorry, but Mr. Durham isn't in. Are you his secretary? Yes. Well, then perhaps you can help us. We're special agents of the FBI. The, the FBI? That's right. But, but what... It's about a stone which Mr. V.A. Madison purchased here a couple of days ago, a 20-carat emerald. What about it? Mr. Durham told Mr. Madison he had obtained the stone through the liquidation of an estate that same day. Yes, that's true. We've just checked, and there is no record of any such estate liquidation. What? But the emerald exactly fits the description of one stolen in an eastern city recently. Good heavens, what... There must be some mistake. I'm afraid the mistake is Mr. Durham's in knowingly receiving and disposing of stolen goods. Now, where did he really get the emerald? I don't know. Has he gotten other stones the same way? Well, yes. I mean, that is, We're I... convinced Mr. Durham is dealing with agents of a ring of jewel thieves, miss. Well, if he is, I don't know it. They don't come Craig. here. And... Yeah. I found this on Durham's desk. What? Flowers are my hobby, you know, and this is a Dutch variety of tulip bulb. Well, what about it? Well, it's not only an odd place for a tulip bulb to be, but this is a very odd bulb. What do you mean? Take hold of the roots at the bottom and pull. That's it. Well, what... Well, the, the bottom comes out. Yeah, and the bulb is hollow inside. Oh, for the love of Pete. What do you know about this, miss? I didn't know that about it. What do you mean? Well, I mean, Mr. Durham buys a lot of tulip bulbs. From but whom? A greenhouse out in Millville. Yes? Every time they have some of a certain special variety, they let Mr. Durham know. I'll say it's a special variety. Sounds like the florist could be the fence. Sure, and hides the stuff in hollow tulip bulbs. What's the name of that greenhouse, miss? It's uh, Sheridan's. Highland, I'll stick here and wait for Durham. Right. And since you speak the flower language... I'll get out there and start speaking it right now. Aunt Kathy? Yes? I think we should be getting out of here. Merle, running away is just the thing not to do. But darling, after all, you have committed a murder, and I believe there's a law against that sort of thing. But closing up the greenhouse and running away would immediately pin suspicion on us. Then what is your idea, my sweet? To dispose of Durham's body and his car. Hmm. How, when, and where? We'll drive up to the cabin tonight, lock the body in the car, and roll it into the lake. And Kathy, you're a genius. I would never have... <laughs> Wait. Well, what's the matter? Someone just drove up. What of it? Probably a customer. He's no regular customer. I've never seen him before. Well, we can't turn him down because of that. But suppose I have to take him back in the greenhouse. He won't know there's a body hidden under the benches unless you tell him. Oh. How do you do? Hello. What can we do for you? I'd like to get a few tulip bulbs, please. Some what? Tulip bulbs, Merle. Oh, oh, yes. Well, um, if you'll tell me what kind you want, I'll go back in the greenhouse. Well, that's and... all right. I'll come with you, if I may. Well... Take the gentleman back, Merle. I'll watch the office. Come this way, please. Surely. After you. Thank you. Any particular variety you're interested in? Uh, Pride of Harlem is my favorite Dutch bulb. Oh? Oh, yes. The reason I came here, a friend of mine who trades with you recommended your place to me. Who's that? Pardon? Your friend, I mean. The jeweler, J.P. Durham. Just a minute. Yes? Who are you and what do you want here? Well, uh, I don't understand. You're lying to me. You're no friend of Durham's and you didn't come here to buy tulip bulbs. You're making my work awfully easy for me, Mr. Sheridan. What? What? So I may as well admit now that I'm not a friend of Durham's. 
I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? And I'm not concerned with the bulbs themselves, but the jewels that you conceal inside some of them. Look here. Furthermore, I'd like an explanation for what looks like blood on the floor over there. Also, the car outside with the monogram JPD on the door. You'd better put uh, your hands what? up, Mr. What? FBI. Thanks again, Aunt Kathy. Merle, I think we'll have two passengers in that car up at the lake tonight. What time is it, Brian? Uh, 5.35, why? Highland should have reported back here by now. Maybe he had trouble finding the place. Shouldn't have had too much trouble. He knew the name of the town and the name of the greenhouse owner. Well, maybe he wasn't in and Highland is waiting for him. There wouldn't be any sense in calling us unless he had some information. No, perhaps you're right, but... But what? I don't like the whole setup. What do you mean? Well, in addition to not hearing from Highland, we can't find Durham. Mm. I'm not exactly crazy about that part of it myself. He's mixed up in this, and if he's running out, I don't want to give him too much of a lead. If he's running out, and the man who owns the greenhouse isn't in, maybe they're both taking the trip together. Yeah. Well, one thing is sure. What's that? We're not doing anybody any good sitting around here. Let's get out to that greenhouse. Merle, hmm? did you get Durham's body in the car? Yes. I didn't realize my own strength. Is, uh, is there anything else we have to do? Not that I can think of. Well, then, I think we'd better be going. It's a long drive to the cabin, and the FBI is no one-man organization, you know. What do you mean? Oh, they'll be sending some other men along to look for this one when he doesn't show up. You're right. I'll be ready to go in a minute. What are you doing there, Mr. FBI? Uh, nothing. Just rearranging some of the flowers. What are you doing that for? Well, I'm rather fond of flowers myself, and the colors you had in this centerpiece bothered me. We're not interested in what bothers you. Mm, I always heard that they allowed the condemned man to do what he liked during the last hours. Stop fixing those flowers. Merle. What? Uh, did you check the gas and oil in Durham's car? It won't be a very good idea to be stopping anywhere with our passengers. Everything is taken care of. Let's go. <laughs> They sure seem deserted, Craig. Yeah. Got your flash? Right here. Let's see if we can get in the greenhouse and have a look around. Try this door here. Oh. Didn't bother to lock up anyway. No. Throw your light around. Come on. Let's take a walk down this aisle and see what we Craig. can see. Craig. Yeah? Look. Yeah. Looks like blood. I hope it's not Highland's blood. Wait a minute. Shine your light over there. What is it? Highland's identification card. What? It was lying on the table with this bunch of flowers. Say, those flowers seem to be arranged in a special way. Yes, and I've got a hunch it's supposed to mean something. You think Highland managed to leave us some kind of clue? Yes, he knew his flowers, and flowers have special meanings. Uh, what kind of these? I think one of them's a verbena. Yeah. Yeah, my wife planted something to make a border. Let's get on a phone and call the Daily Journal's library and find out what a verbena means. Right. If that doesn't tell us enough, we'll find out what these others mean and get the whole story. <sighs> this is getting to be a bore. Now, Merle, just relax. After all, we can't roll a car and two bodies into the lake as long as that that moonstruck couple is parked down there. Well, you'd think they would have had enough smooching in two hours. Wait a minute. I believe that... Yes, they are. They're driving off now. Thank heaven. Well, Mr. FBI? I think I know what you mean. You'll please walk out of the cab into the car and get in beside the late Dr. Durham. Well, I guess the message I left for my associates to find has failed me. What do you mean? What message? The flowers you made me drop. And my identification card you didn't see me drop. What? Surely you know the language of flowers. 
a verbena meant pray for me. That was to let them know I was in your power. And the milkwort means hermitage, which they could easily translate into this isolated cabin of yours. Very clever. But I'm afraid they wouldn't know where this cabin is. Your friends and neighbors do, and they'd gladly cooperate with the FBI. Then, Aunt Kathy, I'd say let's get this over with and move away from here. Yes. Get up from there and start for the door. Okay. Got oh, that gun. Oh. Oh. Craig, am I glad to see you. We finally figured out your message, Highland, but we were afraid we'd be too late. It is too late for Durham. And it could have been for me unless... Well, do you know what smooching is? Why? I'm very thankful for it. Tried on the more serious charge of murder, Merle Sheridan's aunt was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Her nephew received a long term in a federal penitentiary for receiving and disposing of stolen goods. And the arrest of these two led eventually to the apprehension of the gang of jewel thieves, all of whom are now serving prison terms. Yes, professional thievery is a business, operating sometimes on a nationwide scale. But likewise, the law operates on a nationwide scale. And no matter how cunning the methods of the one, they are no match for the unrelenting vigilance of the other. And it is inevitable, always, that sometime, at some point, the twain shall meet. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. But first, let me refresh your memory on the more important features of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Remember that the mortgage interest is only 4%. Remember that if the owner dies, the widow owns the home without any mortgage at all. Yes, the Assured Home Ownership Plan is practically foreclosure proof. To get the full story, talk to an Equitable Society representative in your community. Ask him for literature that gives all details. You'll find him in your local phone book under the name Equitable, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Friendly Killers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Friendly Killer. On this is your FBI. Have you ever been hungry, really hungry, so hungry that it hurts? 
It's an unpleasant sensation even for a few hours. Well, imagine how it is to feel that way month after month, to live for years on a starvation diet. And then remember that right now, 500 million people in the world are desperately hungry. Millions of them will die unless we send them whatever food we can spare. Support your local food collection campaign or send a contribution direct to Emergency Food Collection, New York City. That's Emergency Food Collection, New York City. Give so the starving may live. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In a few minutes, the Equitable Society, sponsor of this program, will have an important announcement for homeowners and for all families that are thinking of buying or building a home. If this is your husband's night to go bowling or attend lodge meeting, please listen carefully to this announcement yourself so that you can tell him all about America's finest plan for home ownership, a plan that can save you money and give you greater security in a home of your own. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Killers. The most alarming feature of the current crime wave in America is not just the fact that it is the largest in the history of the nation. Rather, it is the probability that the majority of those who have helped to make it the largest, the thousands of juvenile and adult beginners in crime, it is the probability that the majority of them will join and thereby expand the ranks of the professional criminals. That is the most alarming part of it. For it is the professional criminals, like those in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, who live solely by preying on the lives and property of others. It is they who form the cancerous area on the moral body of our society. And any permanent increase in their number only spreads the malignancy and shortens the distance to fatal degeneration. Most any other couple would have celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary by at least dining out or having in a few friends. But William and Betty Gates preferred to spend the day and evening quietly together in their modest little home in Cleveland. It's after supper now, and they've just settled down on the living room couch. William slips an arm about his wife and draws her closer to him. Bet, honey, it's been a mighty nice day, hasn't it? Sure has but not any nicer than all the other days we've spent together. Uh, now, that was a real sweet way for you to put it, honey. Well, it's, it's just how I feel about it. You know, Bet, we got a lot to be thankful for. Indeed, we have. Comfortable home, our feeling for each other. And the work Walter's been giving me keeps us going along good. Uh, I, I guess we ought to... Oh, shit. Now, who do you suppose that is? Well, I sure hope it's not company, but I better go see. Maybe it's just the paper boy to collect. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes? How does it feel to be married 25 years? Walter! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Oh, Bill, you old cousin. Did you and Betty think Patsy and I had forgotten what day this is? Oh, now, say, now, we're mighty glad you dropped it. Well, thanks. Come on in. Come yeah. in. Go ahead. Go. Okay. Bet, <laughs> we got company. Good company. It's Walter and the missus. Well, 
Oh, well, hello there. Congratulations, Mrs. Gates. <laughs> Thank you, You're honey. You're congratulating the wrong one, Patsy. What do you mean? It's Bill you want to congratulate for Betty letting him stick around for 25 years. Oh, oh see <laughs> here. <laughs> well, anyway, here's a little package for you both. Oh, Mr. Carter. Oh, that's you nothing, Mrs. Gates. Walt has got a real surprise for you. You mean there's something more? Just wait till you hear it. Bill, how would you and Betty like to have a day at Niagara Falls? What? Niagara Falls. That's right. Never been there, have you, Betty? No. Well, that's the surprise that we've got for you. Oh. We got a compartment for you both on the train to Buffalo tonight, and it's just a little short run from there to the falls, and you can come back the next day. But uh, would we have to go tonight, Walter? Yeah, you would. Why? Because there'll be a man getting on in the compartment next to yours headed for New York with a satchel full of bonds worth $50,000. And you want us to steal them? That's right. Well, for heaven's sake, Walter, why didn't you say that in the first place? Yes. Just think, Bet, at last we're going to see Niagara Falls. Excuse me, friend. You, you haven't gone to bed yet, have you? Who is it? Uh, this is your neighbor in the compartment next door. Oh. Hello there. What's on your mind? <laughs> well, now, there's something I forgot to tell you when we were talking back in the club car. What's that? Today happens to be our 25th wedding anniversary. Well, congratulations. <laughs> what do you know? So my wife talked me into inviting you in for a little nightcap drink or two. Oh, I see. How about it? I'd be delighted. Oh, that's fine. Uh, Betty? Yeah? Uh, Mr. Burnett's coming in for a drink. Oh, how nice. I'll just close my door. Sure. Now, go ahead in, Mr. Burnett. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I, um, I hope you have a taste for wine, Mr. Burnett. Sure. <laughs> this is real good. I, I made it myself. Here you are. Thank you. William? Thank you, Bet. May I propose a toast? Of course. Here's to the love... <clears throat> William, that was very rude of you. You hit him before he finished the toast. Next morning, in answer to a telegram from the conductor... Special Agent U. Miller of the New York office of the FBI met the incoming Cleveland train at Grand Central Station and went immediately to compartment A in car 426. A few minutes later... And when the porter wakened me, Mr. Miller, I was still in their compartment here. And of course, they were gone. And the bonds were gone from your compartment? Yes, sir. You say the couple got off at Buffalo? The conductor said they had booked the compartment only that far. Well, I see they were careful enough to do a little cleaning up before they left the train. How do you mean? The wood and metal surfaces in here seem to have been gone over with a wet cloth recently. They weren't leaving any fingerprints behind. Oh, but surely there must be some kind of clue that would help. Can you give me a good description of the couple? Yes, yes, of course I can. The bonds, what kind were they? Uh, Valley Gas and Electric Company in units of $1,000. Registered? No, sir, just coupon. And they'd certainly have no trouble disposing of them. I'm afraid not. Do you have a list of the serial numbers? Yes, in my office in Cleveland. Uh-oh, that'll cost us a little time. They may sell the bonds before we can alert all banks and brokers of the list of the bond numbers. Oh, I can have my office on the phone in a few minutes, Mr. Miller. All right, and have your secretary phone the list to our office there. I'll call the agent in charge there now and give him the story. Good. Then I think you and I had better hop the next plane for Cleveland. Why? Well, a couple boarded the train with you, didn't they? Yes. In all probability, Cleveland is their base, too. They'll likely head back there from Buffalo. I see. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's make those calls. Right. Well, I imagine that's Walter come for the bonds, Bet. No, I'll let him in. Just a minute. Hello, Betty. Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Thanks. Uh, where's Bill? Right here, Walter. Oh, good, good. Did you get the bond? Yep. Well, where are they? 
Right here. Here you are. What'd you do to the guy? Oh, he was the nicest man, Mr. Carter. We invited him in to have a drink in honor of our anniversary. Yes, he was. He's a very sociable hey. fellow. He... Holy cats, Bill. What's the matter? He's bonds. Well, what about him? I thought the guy was carrying Cleveland Municipals. These are Valley Gas and Electric. Well, there's $51,000 bonds there anyway. Well, you know what the market is on them now? No. Well, they're not listed on the board, but I know. Bonds are my racket. These are only worth about $300 a piece. Huh? Ah, too bad, Bill. That cuts yours and Betty's third down to five grand instead of 15. Oh. Well, anyway, that's 5,000 more than you would have had, isn't it? And besides, you had a nice trip to Niagara? Uh, yes. Well, I won't keep you waiting for your cut. Yeah. There's your five Gs. Uh. Thanks, thanks ever so much, Walter. I uh, better get going, get rid of these before they get too hot. So long. Bye, Mr. Uh, so Carter. So long, so long, Walter. William. Uh, what, honey? Do you think Mr. Carter was telling the truth? I don't know, Bet. But I'm sure we're going to find out. Say, what's the matter with you fellas here in the Cleveland office, kidder? 24 hours and the bond thieves still at large. Okay, okay, Miller. The next plane for New York leaves in 30 minutes. Uh, no leads yet, huh? Uh, it takes time to alert all banks and brokers in the country. Sure, but they should all be on notice by now. The bonds may have been disposed of before they were alerted. Even so, whoever bought them ought to be yelling. Do you still think the thieves base here in Cleveland? Sure. Why? Well, we've got no record of anybody answering their description. And neither have the police. Yeah, but just the same. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Kidder speaking. Uh, this is C.P. Adams in the state building. Yes? I'm a broker. Oh, just a minute, sir. Get on the other phone, Miller. This may be a lead. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Adams? I have no complaint against the FBI. I'm sure you got out your notices as soon as possible. But... Uh, yes, sir? Unfortunately, my secretary was out when my notice came, and she's just handed it to me. One hour too late. What do you mean? I bought those stolen bonds one hour ago. I see. Well, please don't disturb anything in your office, Mr. Adams. We'll be right over. William? William? Oh, I'm in here, Betts. Oh. Well, been home long, William? Not long. I didn't mean to get home after dark, but I went downtown to do some shopping late, and I met that Mrs. Wilson. Oh, I know what that means. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. Talk, talk, talk for hours, seems like. Yep. Just can't get away from her without... Well, for heaven's sake, William. Isn't that Mr. Carter? That's right. Well, why have you got him gagged and tied up in that chair? Well, can't you guess? Oh... You found out something. Yes, I'm afraid he was lying about what the bonds were worth. Oh, what a pity. Hmm. How much they're worth? Face value, $50,000 plus interest. Hmm. Has he already sold them? Yep. Where's the money? Oh, we'll get it all right. Goodness. Imagine him trying to pull a stunt like that. Bet the trouble with crime, there's too many amateurs like Walter in it. His last mistake cost him two years. Yes, and he come mighty near getting us in the soup kettle besides. Mm, well, he's got himself in one this time. Uh, what are you going to do with him? I was just waiting till you got home and for it to get dark. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hand me the choker out of the drawer, would you? Oh, sure, dear. Now, look, Walter, I, I'd like to take your gag out, but the neighbors might hear you and get an idea something was wrong. Uh, uh, will this thing do, William? This, hmm? uh... Uh, yes, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, Walter. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, 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 I know you don't like being choked, but it'll be all over real soon. <laughs> He's gone, Bet. Yes, poor fella. Well, it's getting late. I better fix some supper.
And now, before the FBI file on the friendly killers resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has a special message for young couples who are setting up housekeeping in this first year of peace, 1946. A message, in fact, for all families who intend to build or buy a home or who now own a home. We have a plan that's made to order for you. It's called the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. And it offers you security along with these five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. And besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with a canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage, pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years, saving six years' interest. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyers' fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission or bonus charges. Frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home... Get complete information on the Assured Home Ownership Plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Killer. There are a lot of amateurs in the field of crime, both beginners and habitual criminals, who are so engrossed in the achievement of their main objective, whether it be profit or emotional gratification, that they commit many glaring blunders which lead to their defeat. But the most seasoned and most calculating of professional criminals, such as the murderer called William Gates in tonight's case, differ from the amateurs in this respect only that they make fewer mistakes. But inevitably, they make at least one mistake, leave at least one clue, and it takes only that one to defeat them. It was only a couple of hours before William Gates and his wife Betty murdered Walter Carter that Special Agent Kidder of the Cleveland FBI office and Special Agent Miller received the telephone call from the bond broker, Adams. A few minutes later, in Adams' office... You say, Mr. Adams, that you bought the stolen bonds only about an hour before you received our warning notice. Uh, yes, as I told you, Mr. Kidder, my secretary was out when the notice was delivered. Hmm. Unfortunate timing. Well, that's certainly not your fault. Uh, thank you, sir. The man who sold you the bonds. Uh, he gave the name of Jackson, but now that I know they were stolen bonds, I assume uh, that's not his real name. Can you describe him? Well, I'd say he was of medium height and weight, a well-tailored gray suit. Uh, or... Pardon me, sir. You say only medium height? Uh, that's right, Mr. Miller. And how old? Oh, I judge not more than, well, under 40, anyway. That's not the man we were looking for, Kidder. Uh, how's that, sir? It was a man and his wife, Mr. Adams, who stole the bonds originally. And the man's description doesn't tally with the one you've given. How did you pay him for the bonds? I sent out for the cash. He said he needed it right away for another transaction. I see. Is everything in your office exactly as it was then? I haven't disturbed a thing since our phone conversation. Mm. Do you smoke cigarettes, Mr. Adams? Uh, no, sir. There's a half-smoked cigarette in your ashtray. Why, uh, uh, he smoked that himself. You positive? Yes. Uh, I had to pass him the tray. I... I remember. Yeah. And there ought to be a print on that cigarette. Right. We'll take the tray and all, if you don't mind, Mr. Adams. Go right ahead. And if you'll give us a more detailed description of the man, we may start getting somewhere pretty fast on this. Uh, 
Hello, Mrs. Carter. Oh, hello, Mr. Gates. I'm sorry to bother you this late in the evening, but... Uh, Walter's not here. Uh, yes, I know. He, he was the one sent me. Oh, come in. Uh, thank you. Where is Walter? He's uh, hiding out. Where? Well, now, he told me not to tell you because uh, you'd be sure to come to him and he doesn't want to risk uh, getting you in trouble, too. What do you mean? Well, Walter thinks that somebody's on his trail since he sold those bonds. He didn't think that when he left here late this afternoon. No, I'm only doing what he told me, ma'am. What did he send you here for? He doesn't want the money here in case the police start searching the apartment. I don't believe it. You believe this, ma'am? Where did you get his keychain? Walter gave it to me so you could open the cash box. But I don't know the safe combination. He gave me that too, ma'am. Look, if Walter's trying to pull a run out on oh, me, I'll... Now, now, now. You, you know he wouldn't do that to you, ma'am. He'd double-cross his own grandmother. I'd better get this money for him, like he said. Okay, but you tell him what I said. If he's trying to pull anything funny, I'll fix him good. <laughs> Kidder speaking. Hello, this is Miller. Oh, good morning, Miller. We haven't got the answer back on the cigarette prints yet. We don't need the answer now. Why not? The man who sold the bonds to Adams was Walter Carter. How do you know? The description checks exactly. And the police fished Carter's body out of the river 30 minutes ago. Yes? Is this Mr. Carter's apartment? That's right, but he's not here. Are you Mrs. Carter? Yes. We're special agents of the FBI. The FBI? We'd like to come in. But uh, Mr. Carter's not here, and this I... This is a search warrant, Mrs. Carter. Oh, come in. Go ahead, Miller. Thanks. When did you see your husband last? Why, he left yesterday afternoon late. Where was he going? He said he was going out of town. Is that all he told you? Yes, he never discusses his business with me. What is your husband's business, Mrs. Carter? Why, he's a, a promoter. What does he promote? Why, he... Look, tell me what this is all about. You don't know, Mrs. Carter? I, I don't know anything about anything. Your husband sold $50,000 worth of stolen bonds yesterday. What? Where did he get them? And what did he do with the money? I don't know. Mrs. Carter... This morning, your husband's body was found floating in the river. Oh. oh! I'm sorry. Apparently, that is news to you. Why? Why wouldn't it be? Perhaps you will help us now. It, it's like I said. I don't know anything about anything. Very well, Mrs. Carter. But if you should uh, think of anything, let us know. I'll answer it, Bet. Hello? Mr. Gates? Yes? This is Mrs. Carter. Oh. It's important that I get in touch with Walter, since you know where he is. Oh, but I, I don't. He, he left town after I gave him the money last night. Uh, uh, didn't say where he was going. Oh, but this is very important. Well, is there anything I can do? Well, it's about another job that just came up. Oh, I see. And, uh... Walter will miss making an awful lot of money if he doesn't get to handle it. Well, now, maybe, uh, uh, maybe you and I could handle it for Walter, ma'am. Oh, would you, Mr. Gates? Oh, sure thing. I'd do anything for you and Walter, ma'am. Wonderful. Then I'll be at your house at 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> I reckon that's her now, Bet. It's about 8 o'clock. You better be careful, William. She might be up to something. No, I believe she was telling the truth, Bet. Well, I wouldn't be so sure. Well, come in, Mrs. Carter. Thanks. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Carter. Good evening. Well, looks like you might be going to do some traveling. I see you got your bag with you. That's right. 
I am going to do some traveling. Oh? I just stopped by to get a little expense money first. What? Well, now, I don't understand, ma'am. You said over the phone something about I a wanted job. to make sure you'd be at home. What did I tell you, William? And now about that expense money. Yes, ma'am. I'll give it to you quick. Walter's body was found in the river this morning. We both know who did it. And we both know who's got that 50000 Yes, ma'am. I'll let you keep half of it to keep you quiet. And I'll take the other half to keep me quiet. Okay? Well, I guess... Most people would think that was a fair proposition, Mrs. Carter. William. Uh, uh, But when your half was spent, there'd be nothing to keep you from talking unless I put up some money. I made you a deal. Take it or leave it. Bet it appears there's only one thing for us to do. Yes. Now, look here. I don't know what you're up to. Get the choker out of the drawer. No, wait a minute. Take your hand off. Hurry, Bet. Hold her arms, Bet. Stop where you are and don't move. What? Who are these men, William? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, thank you. Well, I guess we must have slipped up somewhere, Bet. You did. By murdering Walter Carter. Yes, but. And you... Mrs. Carter. We were sure you knew more than you told us. So we let you lead us here. Come on, all three of you. <laughs> For the murder of Walter Carter, William Gates was turned over to local authorities and sentenced to the electric chair. His wife and accomplice received a long prison term, while Carter's widow was given a term in a federal penitentiary for conspiring with her husband in a theft of interstate transportation of property. They were all members of that vast and rapidly growing army of professional criminals in America. Your FBI and your local law enforcement agencies have mobilized to meet this army in a struggle that will decide the moral fate of this nation. But the balance of power is in your hands. It is your cooperation, your vigilance, your determination to stamp out crime. It is these that will decide the issue. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. Now, here are just two of the features that we believe entitle the Equitable Society to call the Assured Home Ownership Plan America's finest plan for home ownership. Just think, only 4% interest. And in case the owner dies, the widow owns the home free and clear, the mortgage is canceled. But there are other advantages to this Assured Home Ownership Plan, many of them. To be sure to get all of them plain and clear, call your Equitable Society representative. Get in touch with him by phoning the Equitable Life Assurance Society, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the surplus swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Surplus Swindle. On this is your FBI. FBI. 
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.